Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Hi, and welcome to the Space Policy Show. We have a wonderful episode for you today. We are talking about high volume production of space systems with Dave Eccles, John McBride, and Jeff Jaranik. Before we get into the show and talking about Dave Eccles and giving him a great introduction, I just wanna remind you where you can find us. So you can ask your questions on Twitter at hashtag the Space Policy Show or ask in the video chat below. Um, on Vimeo. And if you want to follow us, you want to get the latest updates, go to aerospace.org slash policy. So Dave Eccles is a pretty great guy. I have the privilege of working with him on a regular basis. He is really unique in the sense that he wears two hats. He's deputy director of the Center for Space Policy and Strategy, as well as general manager for the National Space Systems Engineering Division at the Aerospace Corporation. Not to mention that he's been with the company since 1983, which is before I was born. So he assists the executive director by managing the staff and executing day-to-day -day operations of CSPS and in his NS SSE role, he's responsible for providing aerospace support to senior space decision makers at the Pentagon, which is a very important role. NSSE's primary role is to provide senior leaders with the highest quality objective technical support and analysis available. With that introduction, over to you, Dave. Thanks, Rebecca. It's really a pleasure for us to talk about this subject today. And we're going to talk about high volume production and the effects that that may have on the space industry. Uh, right now, we're kind of on the cusp of a big change. Um, many uh, manufacturers are still producing satellites sort of in the old fashioned way, but there are a few that are starting to mass produce spacecraft. And that's because they're trying to field deploy very, very large constellations of satellites. And really the only way to do that is to be able to mass produce them. Some of these manufacturers like OneWeb uh, and uh, uh, Telestat and especially Starlink are actually at a point where they can manufacture several satellites per day in their factories. So our paper explores sort of how this change could potentially affect the space enterprise. Joseph, can you bring up the cover, please, for the paper? This is our paper that's being released today, The Effects of High Volume Production, HVP, on Space Systems. And I want to just walk you through what's in this picture. If you look in the upper left-hand side, uh, you can see a black and white photograph of a very complex spacecraft sort of being manufactured in the way we've always done it. Um, obviously, they have to be manufactured in clean rooms, and that's still true even with, with uh, mass-produced spacecraft. But generally, in the old way of doing things, it was very much a handcrafted kind of business. Um, engineers would cluster around the spacecraft. Technicians would make adjustments. They would install parts very much a hands-on, handcrafted approach. And we call this, this is the current um, James Webb Space Telescope. That is definitely a handcrafted system. And in fact, um, it's taken years to produce, I think almost uh, more than 10 years at this point before we actually launch that system. That's kind of an extreme example, but it gives you a sense of kind of where we've been. If you look at the bottom of this, uh, of this uh, cover art, you can see an automotive assembly line. We've been building automobiles since the early 1910s using what's called flow manufacturing. That means that there's a product flow through the factory and operations occur as the object being produced kind of flows by. Now, flow doesn't necessarily mean that it's on a conveyor belt moving past you. It could be that it's moving from one station to another, but it's doing that more or less on a very regular basis, and people are doing operations at each station. That's what we mean by flow manufacturing. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner of this cover, you can see the SpaceX uh, uh, Falcon 9 payload with 60 plus Starlink spacecraft stacked in it. That's an example of the change. Whereas an old spacecraft would fill that entire payload and they'd be very large and heavy, the new way that we're doing these uh, high volume manufacturing is to have many of these stacked in the payload and then all launch, launched at once. And you have to have a high volume production flow manufacturing 
capability in order to support that kind of a cadence. So if you think about these changes, they're happening rapidly. Um, so what I would like to do now is introduce um, uh, our other two um, uh, speakers that are going to join us today. If you can bring them up, Joseph. Uh, so first in the middle is uh, Jeff Juranic. Uh, Jeff is one of my co-authors on the paper. Jeff's a senior engineering specialist at aerospace. Uh, he's been with us for over 12 years, but he has a long career prior to that with many other uh, companies, Raytheon, uh, Boeing Satellite Systems, uh, Hughes Radar Systems. One of the interesting things that he's done in his career is uh, being involved in leading the development of xenon ion propulsion at Boeing. Uh, but he's a manufacturing engineer and he's been involved in many factors related to figuring out how to do mass production and analyzing how many people are doing that in the space business. So he'll be talking about some of the lessons learned that we've learned from other industries and how that applies to space. I would also like to introduce our special guest today, John McBride. Uh, some of you may have heard of John. He's got a long and storied career uh, in the aerospace business. Uh, over 35 years at various places. And one of the things that makes his career particularly interesting for today's discussion is the fact that he's been involved at the, in the original Iridium Constellation development, which was the first time anybody tried to mass produce satellites. And he's going to share some of that experience with us. He's also been involved in consulting for Iridium Next and also for a variety of other companies, including Spectrum Astro, General Dynamics, uh, Orbital, uh, he's been advising Skybox. Skybox builds spacecraft sort of do, using a batch manufacturing technique where they build many, many pieces at once and then move them on to the next station. It's not quite the same as flow manufacturing, but definitely moving in that direction. He's also worked for Maxar, uh, for OneWeb. He's consulted at Relativity and, as I mentioned, already at Ridium Next. So we're going to have an opportunity to hear from both of these uh, distinguished uh, uh, engineers during the conversation today. So I'm going to ask each of them to talk to us a little bit. And then after we do that, I've got a series of questions to ask so that this will become more of a conversation. So what I'd like to do first is turn some time over to Jeff Duranik. Jeff, one of the things, of course, that we did in our paper was we pulled lessons learned from traditional manufacturing and tried to figure out how to apply those lessons in high volume production. So could you talk to us a little bit about that and about the um, uh, design for production framework that sure, uh, you developed the paper. Uh, great. Um, so we developed the design for production framework to be able to visualize and explain the concepts better. Do that with a cone, and we have five layers. Um, we uh, we show five different layers down to the core foundation. We start with. Uh, the goal, which is is high volume production, we uh, break, broke that down into basic principles, which are ease of manufacturing, efficiency, and economical production. And just to give a, a little background on each of those. So ease of manufacturing is really figuring out how to produce the product in the simplest, uh, easiest possible way. Uh, efficiency is how, how the work is actually performed. And then economical production is um, when the product and process uh, design is simplified and standardized. So going to the next layer, we identified uh, three focus areas. So we have product design, we have process design, and we have pro production planning. So pro product design is once the concept design and requirements are defined, and it, it, it's the start of the detailed uh, design and development process. Uh, process design is different and, and that involves uh, process characterization. And the goal is to achieve repeatable processes. Production planning is very important for high volume production. <coughs> and in the past, that's been an area that's been kind of neglected with the traditional approach but it involves establishing production requirements, uh, establishing a product flow, and figuring out how to build at rate production. Because as you kind of indicated, we're talking about from hundreds to thousands of, of, of satellites now. Um, second to last are the strategies. 
So there's over a dozen different strategies that we identified. And two of them that I'm just going to very briefly talk about is design for manufacturability, assembly, and test. And what that really is is talking about is, is how to uh, uh, perform the design with fewer parts, with flatter bill of materials, um, and, and putting, uh, building in test access points. And, and um, uh, another one of the strategies is known as HALT. So HALT is highly accelerated life testing. And that's a very important tool for uncovering failure modes. And it does that by using a combination of different environmental stress limits uh, that are that are far far above the design limits, um, and that is a very important tool for achieving repeatable quality. Um, lastly, I'm just going to talk about the foundation. So the foundation is concurrent engineering. Um, con con concurrent engineering requires early involvement of manufacturing in the design phase. Uh, the focus is on producibility and cost reduction. And in a nutshell, that, that's the design for production framework that we've developed at Aerospace. Thanks, Jeff. Um, that's uh, really appreciate your summary of that. By the way, uh, if you're interested in learning more about the specific details of any of those strategies, we've got 12 or 15 of them that are described in detail <laughs> in the appendices of the paper. And those are particular things which we think are applicable to the development of space systems. So would encourage you to download the paper and take a look at those things. Um, uh, Joseph, can I ask you to bring up uh, figure three for just a moment? One of the things that we really looked at as we started studying this high volume production problem is trying to understand what are the things that change from a traditional spacecraft design development process. And if you look at this diagram, of course, what we want to do is produce a qualified product that will work when it gets on orbit. Um, and what you have to do when you are manufacturing those in mass in a high production way is that you need to go through a process at the beginning where you, as, as uh, Jeff mentioned earlier, where you go through this product design, process design, and production planning. You have to figure out how you're going to build your factory um, and how those processes are going to mesh together. And you have to figure out how the supply chain is going to feed that process. So there's a new step that occurs up front that requires a lot of effort, and that's what this diagram shows. Joseph, can you bring up figure four? So when you look at this drawing, what we're showing here is kind of the change. On the bottom is sort of our traditional satellite production, especially on government acquisitions. It can take as long as five or anywhere from five to 15 years, usually more on the 15-year side in order to actually design, develop, and get a, get a spacecraft up and orbiting. And mission assurance and worrying about trying to make sure things are done right occurs through that entire process. Now, when you're doing high volume production, that's still true. There's mission assurance that occurs early and that, and that it can occur later. But the focus of the mission assurance effort is up front to make sure that you have that, that qualified production capability. Um, uh, John McBride is going to elaborate a little bit on how mission assurance actually applies in in different ways when you're doing high volume production. Um, but there's definitely a move to the left. The effort shifts to the left and a lot of the upfront engineering has to occur before you start mass producing things. Um, but there's also some other aspects to this that John is going to explain from his own experience, both on uh, Iridium and on Iridium Next. Uh, and on other systems. What I would like to do now is actually turn the time over to John. Uh, John, what I'd like to ask you is if you could share your thoughts and observations on mission assurance, especially on design flexibility. Because one of the things people are worried about is, well, boy, when I start mass producing these things, do I still have design flexibility? That's a key thing that is an element that I know you're going to discuss with us. And then finally, how risk management changes. So if you can address that, really appreciate it. Thanks. Sure, Dave, thanks. Um, mission assurance in a high volume production environment it follows the same basic uh, fundamental processes that have been uh, used in the industry for 50 years. However, they are applied um, 
in many cases, uh, much more aggressively and much earlier in the program and much earlier in the production flow. Um, we do not want to be finding uh, component failures, workmanship errors, or things like that at the fully integrated satellite level uh, in the middle of a flow. You can understand the risks associated with that. So much of the testing, much of the qualification, much of the um, uh, verification of the design is done as early in the process, the design process and in the production process as is possible. So uh, when you get to the production floor, we want to have as few discovered defects as is humanly possible. Uh, there is, however, an element of mission assurance that is applied uniquely uh, after uh, the satellite leaves the factory. And that is the aspect of uh, incorporating discovered um, improvements, let's say mission assurance adjustments or things like that that need to be made to the design that are only discovered as a result of um, orbit on orbit operations. So these would um, historically have either not um, affected a single satellite because they're statistically low probability, or they might have uh, affected a satellite in a catastrophic result and then the program is over or um, they would have been mitigated by operational constraints or workarounds or redundant function or something like that. In the, in the case of a constellation, we are constantly monitoring the performance of the earliest deployed satellites in order to find those um, anomalies, those issues, those tweaks, and incorporate changes to mitigate those in the uh, production and in the even component designs. So the mission assurance aspects of mission operations has to be connected to the production aspect and to the design aspect continually. And that's unique to a high volume production environment. Um, design flexibility, obviously you can, you can see why design flexibility would be important. Uh, because we are continuously discovering um, problems, challenges, improvements, uh, performance issues, um, even network optimization that, that uh, we discover uh, as a result of the uh, deployment, um, we have to be able to make changes to the product, the work in process, the WIP, um, and make those changes not only early, all the way back at the component provider, but dynamically at various um, uh, places in the production flow. So if we discover, let's say that an oscillator has uh, a, a, a challenge in stability, we would then have to make a change to the operations for the satellites are already in orbit. We would have to make a change to the screening of the satellites that have already been built and are ready for launch to see if they have a similar problem and then make a unique disposition on that we would have to make a disposition of hardware that's been delivered but not incorporated in the design. And we have to go all the way back to the original uh, component provider and have them make a design change. So all of those incorporations need to be um, made for every single issue that we discover and there can be hundreds. Uh, so for that reason, we want both the hardware design to be flexible and the the production design to be flexible. The factory has to be able to change. We have to add screening tests. We have to uh, change the order of production. We sometimes have to change tooling or test equipment or instructions to the operators. All of that has to be um, folded in while the whole production line is in process. It's you know sort of like changing the cars on a moving or changing the tires on a moving car. So. Um, that flexibility has to be intentionally designed in at the various, very earliest phases of the program. Um, there's, a, there's a video I'd like to show that um, shows a very short snippet of um, uh, the factory, the Iridium Next factory in time lapse. And you can see the process flow, the satellite uh, payloads in the bottom right hand corner. 
the bus in the bottom left hand corner going through integration through test all the way to the, the the far end where they're in the thermal chambers testing for workmanship and then out the door um, to the launch site this process flow was in, it was designed many many years ago and it has been adjusted um, several times during the process in order to incorporate that um, those changes and Finally, um, the risk management is unique for a constellation, and that is because the performance of the product is the network and not the satellite. So uh, the satellites obviously contribute to the performance of the network, but they are not quite field replaceable, but not um, a catastrophic uh, failure if a single satellite fails. A single satellite can be replaced by a spare, by a supplemental launch, something like that. So in those terms, we have to mitigate the overall risk to the constellation, the delivered system, differently than we would mitigate the risks associated with the, the deployment of a single satellite. And that becomes very, very complex in terms of um, the processes, uh, the continual evaluation of risk, the recognition of risks that are realized uh, versus the ones that were identified, and the continual update of, of our, um, our risk posture. The final aspect of risk, which is something that um, a lot of constellation uh, companies uh, especially the early constellation companies failed to address, especially the earliest versions of Iridium, was the external risks. Those are can be regulatory, they can be political, but in, in the case of Iridium, they were the business interests. And that risk needs to be continu continually monitored and mitigated um, by design changes, by deployment strategies, and things like that. All right. Hey, thank you, John. That was fascinating. And thanks for sharing the video. Um, it's really fun to see an actual assembly line uh, putting things out. Um, it's interesting that uh, the point that you make about the early mission assurance, uh, certainly we've seen cases, I think, both with Starlink and with OneWeb, where they actually orbited spacecraft and learned from that and then, and then adjusted the factory flow and changed things in order to make sure that they could get it right. And that's a, a continual process. What I'd like to ask Jeff, uh, if you can elaborate for us a bit here is, how do you think um, high volume production might impact national security space systems? Dave, I think that uh, um, uh, one of the main drivers uh, for national security space is going to be concurrent engineering. Concurrent engineering is uh, an important uh, high production uh, because it helps improve the design quality. Um, I also think uh, using some of the uh, background information from automotive, automotive industry thinks that 70% of the total cost is contained in the design. So I think there's many opportunities for improvement here um, using some of the strategies that I mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, I'd also like to say that I think to achieve high production volumes is going to require a much stricter stance and emphasis on repeatability. Um, business as usual, I don't think is going to get us there. I think it's going to require a paradigm shift. Thanks. Um, uh, your point about the 70% of the design cost, actually, or 70% of the cost being the design, really hit me between the eyes because we talked about how you have to front load these programs. That's something right. which, you know, in, in the government, you know, when they're allocating budgets and they're doing that on an every fiscal year basis, uh, people in Congress, for example, that are trying to support the U.S. Space Force or trying to support NASA. And if we're going to be doing things in a more high volume production way, particularly for the Department of Defense, um, if we go that way, they're going to have to realize you got to upfront load the systems engineering. You got to be able to do a lot of that qualification work and prototyping work up front. And those are the kinds of words that we hear now more from Congress and from other parts of the Department of Defense. I also think it, it in some ways it'll make our space programs a little bit more like other defense programs. For example, if you think about the F-35 uh, fighter, uh, 
uh, or you think about uh, uh, some of the ground vehicle programs in the Army. Um, they go through a, a low rate production phase yes. and then they move to a high rate production phase. And it may very well be that, uh, you know, for example, if the Space Development Agency is successful with their transport layer, they want to go to hundreds of spacecraft in low Earth orbit. They very much may have to do something similar. I know their first RFP has come out with a request for 20 spacecraft, which you can right. sort of consider the low rate production. And then they're going to have to go to a high rate production uh, once they figure out what it is they're actually building. But they're doing it on two year centers so that they can continue to change and inject technology. And right. if there's if there's a motivating factor for what's driving the uh, the Department of Defense to move potentially towards uh, proliferated architectures and higher volume production, it's that desire to be able to upgrade the technology frequently and to be able to stay ahead of the threat. That's one of the one of the motivating factors. Um, uh, John, let me turn to you. Uh, one interesting question that came up in our pre discussion was the impact of high volume production on launch and on the deployment issues associated with this. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure, one of the most um, critical challenges we have in uh, Constellation deployment is the strategic deployment, the matching of the high volume production uh, with the deployment capabilities. Uh, if we can produce uh, a thousand satellites in a year, but we can only launch 600, then we're accumulating inventory. Those those satellites are their inventory cost. They are satellites that can't be easily adjusted uh, in design flexibility, as I mentioned before. Um, that's completely undesirable. On the other hand, if we um, uh, take too long to produce the satellites, we are consuming the lifetime of the satellites on orbit waiting for the full deployment uh, to achieve the fully operational uh, complement. So uh, many of these constellations are not commercially viable until the full complement of satellites are present or uh, at least a complement that meets a certain service stage. So if you think of Iridium, Iridium wasn't a, a, um, Iridium, uh, the initial Iridium block one, was not able to commercially sell any services until we had all of the 66 satellites operating. And so we couldn't take too long building those satellites and deploying them, consuming the life of the earliest satellites. Um, so the, the pace, the, the, the production cadence has to match our deployment strategy the the ability of the integration the the orbital um, network integration and test the launch capacity all of them have to be um, very carefully matched so we are not accumulating satellite inventory on the ground launch vehicle inventory at the launch site or at the in the launch vehicle producer um, satellite inventory on space you know, on in space that's not producing revenue. We can't do any of those things. The simplest thing would be to launch as many satellites as quickly as possible. That becomes um, integration wise a very complex and very difficult strategy. So it's it's uh, there is um, a, an optimum cadence. Uh, it usually works out to be um, a cadence that matches the capability and the availability of the launcher. So if you think of Starlink, they have a certain number of launchers that they can make a year, certain number of the yearly uh, production of um, SpaceX cores can be allocated to Starlink. And so that's the maximum rate at which they can launch. Um, to take longer that, than that would be consuming life. To take shorter than that would be not being able to, to launch them or having to resort to a secondary launch. So the, the deployment strategy seems to be a missing element. Most people fantasize about the fully deployed um, constellation and say that's what it's going to look like when it's done. And uh, this is what it looks like when it's in pieces on the ground, but there's a lot that goes into getting from the the pieces to the constellation. Well, thanks for thanks for sharing that. I thought that was a very interesting insight. Uh, and if you think about it, um, SpaceX also doesn't want to launch so many Starlink satellites that they harm their regular commercial launch business. Uh, you know, they they like you say they have a certain number of cores that they can build, uh, 
And uh, at some point, you know, they got to figure out how to build more. And that might mean tearing down the current factory and building a new one, which is a huge capital expense. And so for those, those uh, constell those constellations ahead. that don't have the advantage of being incestuously associated with the launcher <laughs> as SpaceX and, and Starlink, <laughs> we, have to, um, we have to get the launcher's commitment to meet those launch cadences. And uh, that's a very expensive proposition for them. If we fail to meet their planned launch cadence, they're missing out on other commercial launch opportunities, very expensive for them. So we have to get their commitment. We have to hold to their commitment in that cadence and try to make the whole thing work at a nice natural uh, pace. Yeah, it's not, it's not easy. It's complicated. Let me ask this question. You know, we've talked a little bit about launch cadences and trying to match things. What about the acquisition approaches? You know, the government and commercial acquisition approaches are pretty different. And I'd like to maybe start with you, Jeff, and then maybe, John, have you add your perspective. Uh, what do you think are some things that we need to change in our acquisition approaches in order to support a high volume production world? Um, so as we talk about in the paper, Dave, um, the traditional NSS satellite production is mature. We have tried and true mission assurance approaches, and, and for the most part, it works very well. Um, however, traditional satellite manufacturing is labor intensive. Uh, it emphasizes checking, rechecking, test, retesting, verify, re-verify. In, in order to move to a high production volume model, uh, th that paradigm is going to have to change dramatically. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot more focus on cost. Uh, efficiency of, of, of the manufacturing system. And as I kind of touched on earlier, um, maybe being the most important point is repeatability. And that's uh, uh, repeatable processes, it's improved design quality. It's, um, it, that's the paradigm shift that I think that we're gonna need to move to, uh, to support high volume production. Thanks. John, any thoughts? You've lived on both the commercial and the government side of acquisitions and built real stuff. What's your perspective? So um, the acquisition of components is a, is a, real, um, a real challenge. Uh, every different component has its own optimum production um, strategy. So, um, you know, buying, let's say, uh, propellant tanks, they're going to prefer to build as many propellant tanks as quickly as possible um, and then reconfigure their product product line to move on to a different uh, customer. Uh, others are going to say, you know, we'll, put, we'll produce on a pull system. It's a commodity. Uh, you just let us know. You can buy them in small batches, large batches. We're not going to accumulate a lot of inventory. We don't want you to accumulate a lot of inventory. So, um, and, and obviously, we do not want to accumulate a lot of inventory of, of um, kitted hardware waiting for assembly, waiting for launch. So uh, it's, it's almost a commodity by commodity basis uh, how we strategize for the development. Uh, the more that you get done and held in inventory has to be uh, commercially decided or contractually decided who owns that inventory, who owns the responsibility for making um, adjustments, maintaining that inventory, cleanliness, contamination. You know, if it's a mechanical assembly, they have to be moved every once in a while, things like that. Um, so you have to decide whether that's going to fall on the integrators side of the wall or whether that's going to fall on the component manufacturer side and there's contracts that have to be done. So each one of those gets negotiated individually um, with a goal of making a very streamlined and natural space vehicle integration approach. That's the goal is to minimize the amount of satellites in the factory, the amount of equipment that's in the kit ready for the factory and to make the production flow as efficient and as as highly reliable and, and producing high quality comp uh, satellites as possible. But uh, there is no single solution. Um, you know, we've 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 
done every single um, strategy depending on the vendor and uh, obviously we get into uh, the same thing that uh, a lot of people do that have uh, long-term availability uh, counterfeit part manage management um, uh, part quality uh, a deterioration of part in inventory all of those things we all struggle with but we just struggle with them on a much larger scale thanks john this has been a fascinating conversation. I think maybe as we sort of come to the end, what I'd like to ask each of you is, uh, you know, if you were to think of maybe one major effect that you think high volume production is going to have on the nation's space enterprise, what do you think the largest effect would be? Uh, maybe John, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Jeff. So I think uh, the thing that the commercial um, constellations have faced in the past, which is a dynamic business environment, is something that is analogous to the strategic environment of the U.S. government. So it's not uh, competitors, uh, it's not a market, it's not demand, but it is things like shifting political uh, 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 constraints or opportunities, uh, targets, the uh, things like that. So our US government deployed systems are going to be doing something different than they were originally anticipated to do. And that will be revealed to us over the course of the program. And we have to design the systems to be able to accommodate those changes, to, to leverage the technology, to optimize the performance of the system for the problem that exists at the time of the deployment. Jeff, how about you? Um, Dave, I'm gonna go back to kind of uh, some of the things that I was mentioning about automotive. Um, in, in my past careers, uh, I had the opportunity to go up to uh, the new me plant in Northern California, which is now Tesla. And and at, at that time, uh, Hughes was owned by General Motors, so we kind of had our foot in the door uh, with uh, uh, sending a lot of folks up there. But I, I think if, if you can imagine uh, an automotive assembly plant has a, a tack time or cycle time of like 43 seconds. So that means every 43 seconds, the, uh, the automobile is moving in the production line. Now, we're, we're not obviously gonna be building at rates like that, but what's important, I believe, is the principles. And so uh, one of the things I touched on was repeatable quality or repeatability. We, we gotta figure out how to do that uh, smartly. And uh, uh, certainly there's factors on the design side that have to be looked at. And I think there's obviously things that can be done on the production side uh, process capability, uh, process failure modes, effects analysis, differences as we outlined in the paper. Uh, so I think those things are going to be really important uh, going forward. And I think uh, if we can help educate the government uh, about those strategies and how they're used, I think uh, we, we can, we can, uh, achieve mission success. Thanks, Jeff. Thank Thanks, you both man. for the time that you spent with us today. I think this has been a fascinating conversation. Every time I hear either of you uh, <laughs> talk about this topic, I learn something new and that's very exciting. I do think that there's a lot of people out in, in industry that are sort of looking at um, Starlink and of course, OneWeb, uh, uh, they did uh, declare uh, chapter 11 recently. There is still a little bit of, or a group of people that are thinking, well, the jury may still be out. You got to wait and see if uh, these, if these uh, high volume space systems are really going to be profitable. But if they are, and the indications are that they're, that they're moving in that direction, and, and a lot of people, including the Department of Defense and others, are thinking in terms of proliferated architectures. To do a proliferated architecture, you're going to have to use high volume production. So these lessons are going to be critical, but we're going to be watching to see how the commercial guys fare and then try to learn from their uh, uh, their mistakes and try and do it right for the uh, government side. But it's going to change the industry. There's no question that we're at a point where change is occurring. So it's an exciting place to be. Thank you both. It's been fun. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Talk to you soon. All right.
Thank you so much, Dave, John, and Jeff. We are so excited that you are here with us today and we really appreciate you taking the time. Now, don't forget, download the paper. It's a great read. And in the meantime, if you think about questions that you have, get in touch with us. You can follow us on aerospace.org slash policy, hashtag Twitter, the Space Policy Show. Uh, ask the questions in the video box below. We are very reachable. We love engaging with you. We love answering your questions. So until next time, thank you for tuning in.